You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, presented by The Nation Network. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Oilers Nation Radio, episode 110. I am your friendly neighborhood bag milk join. As always, by Nation Dan, Tyler Remchuk, and Rick, we are here to break down all things Edmonton Oilers. And as we do at the start of every podcast, I thank our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant out in Sherwood Park, Alberta, for all of the work that they do in making this podcast possible. It is now the season to winterize your vehicle. If you need some new tires for the winter, if you need an oil change, a little bit of service, or maybe you just need a new whip in general, head on over to Sherwood Ford. They would be happy to help you. Maybe, Dan, maybe it's time for a new Bronco. Well, it's always time for a new Bronco. I would love a new Bronco. Go ahead and follow them on Twitter at Sherwood Ford and on Instagram at Sherwood Ford underscore the giant. As per tradition, my friend Tyler, while he is eating, will come to you with the Sherwood Ford Giant question of the week. Thank you very much, Bag Milk. Uh, the Sherwood Ford Giant question of the week. Um, it, it was really all any Oilers fan I should wanted to talk about this week. Everyone wanted to share their memories of Joey Moss and talk about what Joey Moss meant to the team. We've we've had some great inter- or heard some great interviews um, all around Edmonton. I think every media outlet did a fantastic job finding old Oilers who who were, I mean, obviously they were all willing to come on and talk about the bond they had with Joey. We had one with Sam Gagne on Real Life yesterday, which you can go listen to right now. Sam is just, like, him and Joey were so tight. And it was fascinating to kind of get a look into the relationship the two of them had. Uh, But back to the Sherwood Ford Giant question. Based off that, what tribute would you like to see the Oilers do? Or maybe tributes would you like to see the Oilers do for Joey Moss so that his legacy can live forever um whoever wants to go first fire away I'll, I'll just start by saying you know i think that for all of us and i said this on real life as well i think that we all rightfully have made fun of the oilers plenty over the years and like i said rightfully so but one thing that they always do well is remember their own and i i really am expecting them to do a really lovely tribute for joey moss and i bet that they're going to execute it very very well in terms of what the ideas look like, I'm sure we all have plenty. My my favorite kind of ones are, I like the idea of, I'm not going to steal Tyler's. He had a great one on real life. Otherwise, I would just steal it and claim it as my own. But like, I love the idea of renaming things like the community rink after Joey, maybe even the Oilers dressing room itself uh, named after Joey, something like that, where you know obviously he had a huge impact to the boys. I think that that would mean a lot to them, as well as just the community knowing that um, if the Oilers put something out there that where that's where he worked, that was his office was the dressing room and to have it named after him, I think would be really appropriate, but I've got a bunch of others. I don't want to steal everybody else's thunder. Dan, I know you're, uh, you're standing by. What do you think? What do you think the Oilers could do for Joey? Well, I think you, you said it well when like, I, I think anybody, anything that anybody has ever mentioned about Joey Moss, nobody's been like, Oh, that might be too much. Cause there just, there isn't enough time and, and respect that can go out for this guy. Um, uh, when you hear comments like you've heard from Sam Gagne, his, his, the quote that I pulled from his Player Tribune article, now as I look back on my time there and think about what it means to be an Edmonton Oiler, I think about Joey Moss. You know, like those kinds of things are just super special. So I, I think that all the ideas that have been bandied about are great. The one that I would, the, the two that I've seen thrown out there, and I don't, I don't, I won't, don't take credit for them or anything, um, but was I think Jason Greger put out the one about using his song, his favorite song, La Bamba, in some kind of, former fashion I think that would be that's something that you know it instantly becomes our Chelsea dagger you know you know the meaning behind La Bamba you explain it and then you know nobody can make any comments about that outside of the organization fans will you know make fun of it or whatever but it's like something that we can really rally around and then the second thing that I've seen I think I saw it on Twitter um, was suggested that his seat and the seat next to him right behind the players bench or is this Tyler is this your yeah (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry, it, uh, but yeah, the the idea of of making those seats available to to kids or or adults with disabilities, um, I think would just be a very fitting, uh, you know, closing of the chapter on. You're never gonna let you're never gonna stop thinking about Joey Moss, but but that spot in the arena deserves to have the same energy that Joey brought to it every day. Um, through through other folks that are going through exactly what Joey went through and are striving because of it. So yeah, I, I think that that's the one there. 
Yeah, I really like it. I, I think if you want to leave it empty for a year to honor Joey, like that, that would be really touching as well. But I, the reason I brought that up and the, re, the way the idea came to me was because uh, at TSN 1260, we had texts all day of people sharing their Joey memories. And someone talked about how at, at the grocery store by their house, there's a boy with Down syndrome. And this person would always talk to him about the Oilers and all that. And one day they got to Joey Moss and the boy leaned in and said, Joey Moss is my hero. And I just thought, man, how cool would it be if every Oilers home game, a different person living with disability and a loved one could sit in the seat that Joey Moss sat in, get a tour of the locker room, get to see what Joey did, and then have some amazing seats for an Oilers game and get to you know fist bump the players as well and all that stuff. I, I think that would just yeah. be a fantastic way to not only honor Joey, but also, you know, give back to the community and give back to a community that loved them. Rick, what do you think? What do you think the others could maybe look at doing uh, to honor Joey Moss? Um, all of the above, honestly. I don't think there's anything that's going too far. Uh, I love the idea of just never using that seat again, um, but always having an invite. I mean, first of all, that's, those seats aren't the greatest seats in the world anyways, right? Like you really can't see a whole bunch behind the bench. So yep. maybe whoever comes gets better seats or whatever, a couple of rows back, whatever. So no, I've, I'm down with that. Uh, the community rink idea, i really big fan of the dress room because that's kind of like where he, that's that was his home. Um, yeah, you can't go wrong here. Just uh, make it big, that's all. Well, and one thing I would like to see too, and I, I, I'm sure the Oilers are working on something um, but is creating a position within the organization where they where they do hire somebody that you know is 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 dealing with the same kind of mental disability that Joey had or or something similar to that and can really show that they can just come in and excel and and they're no you know they yes they have different challenges than we do you and I do but but they come in and they do a job and they create a culture that you know we've seen it we've seen it now from from players that have played here, from players that haven't ever played here. We've seen it from organizations that never had anything to do with Joey talking about his impact on the teams. And so I think that, I think that if you work to try and harvest some kind of, you know, some kind of position within the organization that, that gives people with mental disabilities a chance to just really shine, I I think that would be a, a really suiting and really fitting tribute to a man that, you know, means so much. Dan, that reminds me of uh, a tweet from Wheaton Oil. If you're not following Wheaton Oil, you should. He's a very, very great Oilers follower. And what he said was kind of along the same lines. He says, you know, one really cool thing about Joey Moss was how an organization made an inclusive space for him to do meaningful work. And as a result, not only Joey benefited, but the entire organization and broader community benefited from Joey just being able to be Joey. And when we spoke to Sam Gagne on the Real Life podcast, that's kind of what he talked about. He said, no matter who you were or even what team you played for, Joey was there and he made an impact on your life. Sam talked about when he would come back with other teams that weren't the Oilers and he would bring other players from, you know, the opposition to meet Joey and Joey was always there and he made an immediate impact on whoever he met. And it's just pretty amazing that, you know, he got his job in, you know, it, because of Gretzky, we all know the story. But it went so much beyond probably what anyone would have ever expected. And it was interesting to see the city mourn the way it did because everybody felt it. Whether you were a a fan of the football team or whether you're an Oilers fan, Joey was involved in both. And he was an icon in Edmonton sports and beyond. And I think one of my favorite parts, regardless of what the Oilers do, and I agree with Rick, there is no, there's not too many things. If they want to put a banner up, put a banner up. If they want to rename everything after him, do it. Um, but I think what just kind of showed how much he meant to everybody was the night he passed on, on Monday evening, you saw the outpouring of support from both current Oilers, former Oilers, other organizations and players that have never played here. I think that's a pretty special, um, legacy for a guy to have. And it was really touching to read. Was there anybody, um, was there anybody that kind of wrote something, Dan, I know you brought up the Sam Gagne's player tribune article that kind of just, that one hit you in the field. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, I know TSN 1260 did a great job, you know, get, just giving away the airway basically to, to Joey Moss memorials and stuff. But, uh, hearing from the Barry Staffords of the world and, and Sparky Kuczynski from the, uh, from the eighties era, those guys that were, right there with Joey the whole time. Um, 
I think, yeah, I, like there was nothing around where I was just, you know, I, I just soaked it all up. I read everything. It, it was it was really well done and really, really touching to hear from everybody. I thought Paul Coffey did a great interview when he was on uh, 1260. I think, again, one of those guys you could tell, like every player that came to Edmonton had a deep, had a deep connection with Joey, but there was a group of guys who I think were extra close with Joey and Paul seemed to be, uh, Paul seemed to be, one of those guys, and he shared some great stories about, you know, like the chirps Joey would give guys. Uh, Mike Riley of the Edmonton football team, or formerly of the Edmonton Eskimos, uh, told a great story of how when he would be getting, like, whatever part of his body iced, and he'd be laying on the training table, but, like, taped down so he couldn't move, that's when Joey knew to attack and would, like, be playing <laughs> pranks or doing things to piss off Mike Riley, knowing that Mike Riley could not get up from the training table. Um, it, it just funny, funny stuff like that. I, I think there is just no shortage of great stories to be passed around. I, I will say that it, as sad as it is that he's gone, there's a part of me that's happy that the day, uh, you know, the, the few days of mourning were more of a celebration of what Joey brought to the city. And it really had, a, it, it had a, such a, everything felt like it had such a positive vibe to it, which is great. And I mean, really, if there's a way to remember Joey, it, it's to be positive like that. Like you'd have to imagine that a guy who's known for always, you know, giving you perspective in life and was always smiling around the room and all that, like being able to share the happy stories of it, uh, of Joey's life. I, I think that was great as well. Just, just the overall, the overall vibe that sort of these memories and stuff gave off everyone. Everyone had a great Joey Moss story to share. Rick, anything that stuck out to you? Honestly, all of it. I, I enjoyed every single interview I could hear. I'm the type of guy that loves the, uh, sit back and just listen to to guys you know just tell stories from from back in the day and stuff so yeah no every 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 story man i just sat there and enjoyed and took it all in and uh and smiled the whole time well i think you kind of touched on it too bag milk saying that um it, it's and tyler too you know that it's it's the mo the fact it's it's it sucks that it took you know, the passing of Joey Moss to really be able to hear some of these stories. Um, it was kind of a, it was like a, a guarded secret, I guess. Um, you know, I think, I think we have all heard little stories here and there about things like this, but, but to be able to hear the George, the rock stories about the wrestling in the locker room, same with Gagne, like it's just everything, everything you heard was kind of a, a reaffirmation of the thoughts that we had about him in the organization. And it just kind of, it warms the cockles of your heart to hear that kind of stuff. You know, it sucks that it's posthumously, but, but it, it, it was, uh, it was very special that we were able to get a peek behind the curtains a little bit on that. One of my favorites, uh, just to kind of, you know, wrap it up. It, it, I would really encourage everybody if you haven't done it already. And if you're listening to Oilers Nation radio, chances are you spent a lot of time reading about Joey Moss over the last few days. But my favorite, I think was from Craig Simpson. Um, he wrote about what it was like to meet Joey the day after being traded to Edmonton from the Pittsburgh Penguins. And he wrote, the first day I walked into the Oilers room, a day after being traded there, the first person I met was Joey. He was folding towels, preparing the room for the morning skate. That was November 25th, 1987. Little did I know how much of an impact Joey would have on my life. He was loving, caring, passionate, and a pure soul. He gave us all so many lessons about life and the importance of living it to our fullest potential and not wasting a moment. Joey lived his life to the fullest of his potential and brought out the good qualities in all of his friends who loved him. He made all of us better people for knowing him. Players throughout the years have all, all have a favorite story about Joey that he in his own unique way made special just for them. He was a teammate, a friend, and most importantly, he was a good human being. You gave so much to this world, Joey, and I'm thankful for the 33 years I was able to share with you. And it's just, those went on and on and on whether it was from players that were around in the 80s or even a guy like Nuge where he doesn't tweet at all and he says, you know what, I was very grateful to have nine years of having you as my friend, which it's very clear how much of an impact he made. And I'll include, uh, I'll include the link to uh, at the top of the article on OilersNation.com when this comes out just if you want to hear the Sam Gagne portion of the Real Life podcast from yesterday, I'll include that as well because Sam had some great stories in that 12 minute interview that Tyler and I did. And it's well worth the listen if you haven't heard it already. Um, and just to wrap it up, is there any last kind of thoughts that you guys wanted to share about Joey? That gone, the part in the Gagne interview where he talks about the time Joey made them go to the WWE event at Cineplex. That story is so good. 
Well, and I, I've heard the stories about, uh, I heard through, through a, from the promoter that actually put together the ring for him from his 50th yeah. birthday when they, when they had the birthday party where it was in the, like the dead of winter kind of thing. And they were having these wrestling matches and then Joey goes out and he's, he wants to fight all of these wrestlers <laughs> after the event. And like, and, and like they were, you know, they wanted to, they wanted to give him as much of the experience as they could, but here's Joey like jumping off the top rope kind of thing onto these guys. And just, he's just, he's one of those guys that I, I never had the chance to meet Joey and I'll, I'll forever kind of, I think have that regret um, right up there with not being able to meet Dave Semenko kind of thing. Um, but I think that each one of us knows and, and feels that that pride of this city of Edmonton and the the pride that Joey Moss gave us for, for being fans of the Oilers and the Eskimos, or sorry, the Edmonton football team. Unfortunately, I had never got to meet him um, either. Uh, I got to see him a bunch around the rink. You know what I mean? Where he was doing his thing, which was always great. Tyler, Rick, you ever get a chance to meet Joey? I, I never did, but like covering, uh, you know, I covered the Oil Kings for a few years here, and you'd always be around Rogers Place, whether it's for you know practices or whatever, and you, you'd see Joey moving around a little bit. I think his presence at the rink went down a little bit in these last couple of years here, um, but no, I never had a chance to actually personally meet Joey. We should try to get somebody on maybe for next week, like. Uh, I'm thinking of maybe like Brownlee or something. I bet he would probably have some really great Joey yeah. stories from his time with the team or something like that. Um, Ricky, ever get a chance? Uh, I was thinking about this the other day, and I uh, I really can't think of a time when I did. Um, yeah, no, I, unfortunately, I just I just never did. And uh, but just this whole the whole all the memories over the last couple of days. Um, I don't think it's really surprised me. But I've definitely appreciated hearing it all. Uh, it just, yeah, it puts a smile on my face, and it, it's a good feeling right now. He was a, he's an icon in Edmonton, and I think it was pretty telling how much he meant to everybody just by the, the levels of tributes that were coming out and the number of people that were just so willing and ready to share their share their stories with him. I mean, Tyler on TSN, you guys broke away from the normal programming on TSN 1260 to just talk about Joey. And that was kind of the case for a couple of days. So it was a pretty special life, a pretty incredible human being. And I think that, you know, like we just read, everybody's got a story about Joey and uh, everybody was very, very happy to say it. And then the thing that makes me laugh too, and just makes me smile thinking about it is um, you can tell I'm trying to kill a little bit of time here while I find the quote, but I think, I think the quote about how much he meant to the city, even though he didn't necessarily know it was pretty great. So Barry Stafford once said, he's the most famous guy in Edmonton and doesn't even know it. And it's just the best. It's the best seeing the community come together to tell stories about him. It's the best hearing the stories about him. And from all of us here, I know we're going to miss him, but very much look forward to what the Oilers have planned to honor him next, because what they do now is going to be, you know, it's going to live forever uh, in the city of champions. And that's what Joey was, was a, city, was a champion in the city. Um, changing gears a little bit. I do have to thank our friends at skip the dishes.ca for everything that they do to help make the podcast possible as well. It is a Friday afternoon. It's rainy. If you're looking for something to eat and you don't want to cook and you're able, head on over to skipthedishes.ca, grab yourself something to eat from any of the hundreds or thousands or millions of wonderful spots around our beautiful city. Be sure to tip your drivers. They're putting themselves out there for you. Or maybe do what Rick does and do yourself a little tour. Get yourself something from a couple of different restaurants and have yourself a feast because you deserve it. You've earned it. Skipthedishes.ca, they are here to help and they're here to feed you i can't cook i can cook eggs tyler but there's only so many eggs i can are you good at cooking eggs because you can be bad at cooking eggs buddy i'm great at cooking eggs are you good breakfast cook in general like can you expand into other areas of breakfast foods i make breakfast for dinner so much really yeah, I'll like I'll grab like I'll make my own hash browns. I'll shred the potatoes, do the bacon, the eggs, toast, the whole thing. Wow. Maybe if I'm feeling frisky, some baked beans in there. You know, mm. I like baked beans. I like baked Let beans. Me tell you, my ahead. toast making skills are unparalleled. What else you got in the repertoire though, Dad? Uh, um, I make good bacon. I have a good. I have a good. Uh, 
I have a good system for bacon. I won't give you all the details, but it's it involves a uh, cooling rack. Not uh, not to not to give it all away, you know, right up front. But uh, so yeah, bacon and toast, and I've burned a lot of eggs. I burned soup. I burned soup. So there's that. Rick, See? Rick, you feel like the yeah, guy who might cook, order man. on Rick and cook. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, you, you feel like the guy who I think orders skip the dishes the most out of the four of us, but you're also the guy who can cook better than all of us. Because yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah, you yeah, post yeah. like these steak dinners and stuff, and oh, fuck yeah, man. me, man, they look good. <laughs> I like to eat, man. So if, if I wanted to eat like that, I had to teach myself how to cook. So I think yeah, I in the months since I've moved out of my parents' house, I can like feel myself taking strides towards being a better cook. I'm still oh, in the stage of like basically just being able to assemble frozen meals and do like a few things like that. <laughs> but I'm still like I, I can feel myself like starting to build up the courage to try more things. <laughs> my dad, happen. my dad taught foods in for high school kids, and I didn't learn from him. So there you go. I've gotten better, Tyler. There is like as much as I'm saying I can only cook eggs. I have gotten better, especially in the time living alone over the past two years. I had to, otherwise, there's only so much crap dinner and eggs I can eat. So, yeah. you know, now I'm making roasts. I'm making like shredded chicken tacos, all kinds of stuff. I barbecue up a storm. It's great, Tyler. You'll get there, buddy. Believe yeah. me. But in the meantime, get to <laughs> stop. Yeah, they're there for you. They are there for you, and we are grateful for them. Uh, really quickly, I want to touch on the AHL is targeting February 5th for its start date. Uh, that came out earlier this week. Zach Lang posted about it on nation.com. I'm wondering, gentlemen, do you think the NHL will wait that long or will those still be trying to kick off in January as expected? Rick, I, I know you want them on the ice as soon as possible. What do you think first? Uh, yeah, I think they're going to, they have to kick off first because you kind of, the, the AHL kind of needs the, players they get sent down to try and figure their shit out right so um if that's the thing then i say that you know the nhl will probably start no later than say like a week before them like normal um but yeah i still think they need to get on the ice as fast as possible yeah yeah i think the logistics uh that the ahl have to kind of overcome here uh talking about perhaps having to move stockton bakersfield and utica up north uh is going to be is going to be a bit of a a a touch point for them to have to deal with. So I think that, yeah, you're going to see the AHL start after the NHL. So the fact that they're pushing it a month behind the NHL's announcement makes sense because the NHL teams are going to have to be a part of that transition as well. So you got to think that they're, they're going to follow suit with whatever the NHL does um, when it comes to the, you know, potential of an all Canadian division. So you're going to have all Canadian AHL division as well. Tyler. Yeah. To me, like, I, I was hoping that the NHL would be able to like drop the puck on New Year's Day or something like that. Uh, if if the AHL isn't targeting till February fifth, I wonder if maybe we're not just going to see like NHL camps open on New Year's Day and we're going to have like a quick ten day training camp, like a six day exhibition schedule where you play three times or four times even in six nights with just the teams that are around you. Like Edmonton will play Calgary and Vancouver kind of thing. They'll rush through an exhibition schedule so the NHL can maybe start by like January 16th. Like to me, this just bumped my expectations for when the NHL season will start sort of back two weeks. Yeah, I kind of agree. Like I think like January is when they're going to get started. Um, But unfortunately, I think it was on inside. I'm going to probably butcher this, so don't quote me on it. But it was on insider trading on TSN, Pierre Lebrun or something like that said that they still haven't really started their their meetings yet with the players and the league to figure out what this looked like. Whereas for the return to play in the summer, they did dozens of calls and they haven't quite yet gotten started. And here we are, you know, kissing November 1st, it comes up on Sunday. So they got to get going. I know these calls can happen multiple times in a week and all of that, but you know, there's plenty of work to do. And a lot of players are going to have input on what the next season looks like. This shouldn't come as a surprise, but I also think a big thing is the election on Tuesday. I think that American election will have a big impact on the status of the Canada U S border. And I, and I think the obvious, I mean, not, I think obviously the status of the Canada U S border has a big effect on what next NHL season will look like. Is there an election coming up? I don't even know. I think we're just hoping for all sides to have fun. That's, yeah. that's what we're in the, in the official uh, position. In the yeah. election? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Outside the election. It's a really good point though, because Calgary is starting that, uh, that test where they, uh, if you fly wherever, as long as it's within their rules, it's only a two-day two quarantine when you get home, right? 
And I'd start but like I, right away. But one of the things we have to think about too is that parts of Canada, you know, have already started to institute their own their own issues, you know, with other parts of Canada. So you're seeing that if you go to the Maritimes right now, you have to quarantine for two weeks across Canada. So it's there's there's so much there's so many moving parts that I tend to believe that we're looking at perhaps what the AHL is aiming for their start time as the NHL start time. And How, then you push back the AHL. What's no the least left. amount of games you would accept for an NHL season? I think there's no chance we're getting 82 this year. So what do you no, guys think I, we're going to get? Not with the Olympics kicking off in July. Well, I mean, in theory. I don't think that I don't think that the NHL accepts anything less than like 60 games themselves, though. You got to think that they want to push to 50 or 60. Can we mark this down as like a guess, like what we think is going to happen? Because my guess is that they do like the the lockout year. What was that? 48. 48. Games? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, I'm guessing we get a lockout type season this year. It's, they're going to want more than that. It'll be in the oh, they'll definitely to, want more. They'll be 55 whether... to 60. They'll stay away from that 48 number. For, for just for the whole reason they don't want to even bring that that whole thing up again. <laughs> so like, it's, like dude, 40... it's, like, it's forty-seven or forty-nine. It's forty-eight or or fifty. Like you avoid that number. I could see forty-one as a number just to cut half the season year. straight in half. <laughs> but it's but that's the thing, and it's I think that I think that we kind of talked about it, um, you know, early on in the in the pandemic. Um, but really, it's going to take like two or three years for us to get back to any kind of normal scheduling. I think that's the that's the clear and obvious answer here is that you know no matter how many games they chop it down to next season is going to be pushed back and then the season after that is going to probably end up being affected as well. Whereas I, I don't necessarily agree with that just because they have to be done by the Olympics. So the Olympics is going to be like starting in July yeah, again in theory. So that would take them till what? How long do the Olympics last? I don't even know. Sorry, why do they have to be done by the Olympics? NBC has the broadcasting rights for both, and I and I would imagine like I I I'm gonna sit in the middle of the two of you. I don't think they have to be done by the Olympics. I think they're facing pressure from NBC to be done by the Olympics, and they don't want to piss off NBC. And if the Stanley Cup Finals are going on at the same time as the Summer Olympics, what do you think their ratings are gonna look like in the states? Not great. Yeah, well, to that point, like yeah. the World Series just wrapped up, and it was one of the most poorly viewed world series ever and by all accounts i didn't watch much of it but like by all accounts it was a hell of a series yeah it was there were some great moments in that series i wonder if that's also something the nhl is gonna have to take into account i wonder if a part and i'm not 100 percent sure like how the rating systems work in for tv um but i wonder if people not being able to pack sports bars like i think that's really hurt sports ratings as well because like hypothetically people shouldn't be doing much other than watching sports, but yet we've seen NFL numbers have been down at some points, NBA finals, they were down. NHL was poorly viewed. World series was poorly viewed. I think that the whole aspect of like not being able to go to the local insert sports bar here and watch it with six or seven buddies or have a group of 10 people over to your house to watch the game. I think that's really hurting the numbers here as well. Well, and there's also, I was thinking about that too, because I was thinking about the World Series thing, um, just in terms of the numbers. There's, there, it's different, right? Like going to the pint on a Saturday night to watch an Oilers game with a bar full of people has got a totally different vibe than just, you know, watching it at home and there's pumped in crowd noise or very little crowd noise. Like it's a completely different vibe. Dude, in, every, in, everything was different, man. They, the playoffs this year was. It was brutal, dude. It wasn't. But in theory, what it used to be. But in theory, those those two hundred people that were in the pint, if you say half of them are going to watch the game anyway, so they're going to watch it from home. In theory, the ratings should be up, right? Like I don't, I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense because those people are individually tuning in at home now instead of one television rating from from the box at the pint tuning in. Like I, well, I that's just, just, that's just, that maybe that gets built into the numbers too, yeah, right? Does. If you're going to, yeah, oh, you okay. got whatever your capacity is. So, okay. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, so actually uh, you, you lose, it is you weird. Lose, you wonder, you actually lose it by just by that, right? Like if you said there's 200 people here or we're going to be 200 people, but a hundred will watch at home by themselves. Well, now it's a hundred people viewing instead of like, whatever the number the, at the bar would have been, would have been 200. Yeah. So yeah, you're losing right away. I also think there's a lot of people who their interest in sports is purely social, right? Like, like I think of it too, 
like my interest in UFC. I, as my, I did actually watch the Khabib fight, so maybe a poor example. But like in the past, I really only care about the UFC when it's a huge fight that me and all my buddies are getting together to watch. If there's yeah. not that social aspect, I'm not watching it. And I think there's people who are like that with the other major sports where it's like, oh, yeah, I love watching hockey with my friends. Are you just going to turn on the game by yourself? Eh, no, I don't care about it that much. Or baseball as well. Like, I have friends like that. If I if it was a normal year, I would have been texting my buddies, being like, hey, who wants to come over and watch game six tonight? And I probably would have had some friends over for it. In this case, I was like, Ugh, I'm not doing that. But I guess that too, like, you got to think that we were super saturated for sports. Like, it was, it was, there was that weekend, I think, right as everybody kind of, every season started, like where nine, every yeah. professional league was playing except for the NFL. Like it's, you know, in, or in MLB, I guess, but it, yeah. And, and it started at 9 a.m. in the morning and it was going until, until, you know, two o'clock in the morning kind of thing. So I got, yeah, I don't know. It was yeah. glorious. That first return to play, like when it first kicked in and there was games starting at like 9 a.m. all the way till 11 at night was great. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. Dude, there was that, it was that Boston Carolina game that got pushed uh, to the next day because of the over the yeah. five overtime. So that game literally started at nine o'clock here, dude. It was perfect. It was great. Can I, and Tyler? Uh, you were a, you were a big fan of daytime sports. Oh, we would be recording man. podcasts, and you'd be staring at your TVs behind <laughs> us. Man, these these bad boys sit dark right now, and it is the most depressing thing in the oh. world. So sad. Well, we need sports to come back, yeah. just because you know all that we got right now is 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 football. And so, it's only on three days a week. Yeah, we need it. We uh, need it. NHL, figure it out. NBA is coming back. You know you want to be there with the NBA. You know you do. I want to. I want to float you guys this question here, uh, since we got a bit of time. We were talking about uh, length of schedule in the NHL: forty-eight, fifty-five, sixty, sixty-two, whatever you think the magic number is. If would which one would you be in favor of? If I said we can get sixty games in and it's a normal playoff schedule, or if I said forty-eight regular season games and we're doing the expanded playoffs again? Nope. Fuck that shit forever. <laughs> no more expanded playoffs. <laughs> I don't know. I think because we, I think it's hard for me as an Oilers fan because I'm jaded still with the fact that we were the four seed, but actually a fifth seed according to win percentage, and so we ended up with the the tough position of playing a team that had no business being there. I, I don't know. It, it's I don't want to see I don't want to see sixteen playoff or sorry uh, twenty four playoff teams. Sixteen is enough when more than half of your league is playing in the playoffs you're fine. And I, and it just, it was an unnecessary amount of level of play understandably. So it was needed in the sense, but I just, I just don't think we need to play expanded playoffs going in, knowing that so that's the way it is before the season starts. I don't think would feel as bad as it did this year. Like it felt like we were in and we already, everything was done already. We already took care of it. And then all of a sudden they you took it away from us. But if you go into the season, knowing that at the end of it, you know, it's just another round. Um, yeah, it's not the end of the world. I'm kind of with Rick on this one. I actually liked it. It added a different layer of intrigue to the playoffs and just like a wild card factor. That was just so bizarre. And I think that had there not been a four and a half month break between that, the Oilers would have probably done better than they did. Um, I think that gap really, I mean, like Montreal knocked Pittsburgh out as well. Like there was a bunch of weird things that happened, but I kind of liked it. It was weird. I like, I like. Switching things up every now and then. A little chaos is good. A little chaos is fun. Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, I, I didn't hate it. I agree that if I think it was done right after the... Like, the Oilers just played terribly. If it was done right yeah. after the season, maybe the result's different. Uh, I didn't mind more teams getting a chance at playoff hockey, and I loved having hockey on all day in the bubbles. <laughs> so if we could get that again, like, I just think having that opening round and branding it as, like, all day hockey all week and having games that just went all day. I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cool. For my personal enjoyment, at least, I suppose people with regular jobs who are at work during the day yeah, I mean, uh, might not be thrilled. <laughs> but, yeah, well, whatever. There is that, too. Like, there's They're all at home watching anyways. Yeah, if you're also, working it's not, like, it's not like well, they're well, except anymore. <laughs> except that we saw the ratings, and they weren't, right? Like, yeah. they, I don't know. It's just... It, because I, you have I, a lot of... Like it. You have a lot of, like, Oiler fans but that aren't necessarily hockey fans, mm -hmm. right? Like, they want to watch the Oilers, but as soon as the Oilers game's over, they're washing their hands of it, which is, you know, 
obviously it's a smaller group that's willing to watch everything, but for the most part, they're Oilers fans or, you know, whatever team fans. And when your team's not playing, you don't. I think like, I guess, what the but, answer is, is that they, everybody needs to do what I did and turn yourself into a degenerate gambler so that even <laughs> if you don't care about the games you're watching, there's a little bit of excitement in there for you because you bet for two home team goals in the second period. Tyler? <laughs> That's the way to do it, man. That's why I love the NFL so much. Uh, changing gears a little bit. I want to touch on quickly. Mr. Leon Dreisaitl turned 25 years old this past week. And Leon has developed himself into an absolute warlord since his, what, cup of coffee? It was like six or seven games to start off the season in Bakersfield. He has dominated the NHL over the last couple of years. It's pretty hilarious that his only competition right now really is Connor McDavid, which is a teammate. <laughs> um, I just kind of want to talk about Leon a little bit. Dan, you had him as, what did you say, number five in the number latest five. EA Sports? Yeah, number five. So it goes uh, Connor McDavid, of course. Uh, and then you got, this is just me going off memory, uh, Ovechkin, Crosby, and then in a group amongst themselves, Leon Dreisaitl, Nikita Kucherov, and Nathan McKinnon are all, uh, are all rated the same. Um, and I think you could say you could understand that McKinnon would be in the mix there, um, given his season and everything. But yeah, he's uh, he's he's definitely getting the recognition he deserves um, for being the you know number two, number three, number four player in the world right now. So my question for all of you gentlemen, Leon Drysaddle at his twenty fifth birthday, still plenty of mileage left on that finely tuned German body of his. How good does he get? This good. Like, I think this Can is dry. Uh, I mean, but like, what's better? Can you get better than leading the league in scoring and winning the Hart Trophy while not playing with Connor McDavid? Like, maybe there's a season coming up where he doesn't have like a historically bad month of December. Like, maybe that comes and he ends up putting like 125 points up in a wow. season. But I, I don't know. Like, to me, even with McDavid to an extent, like, they're in their primes right now. This is how good they are. And I expect them to routinely do this. Like, I, I don't even think we're, we we can be expecting, like, bad seasons from these guys. I think it's just going to be a run of these next five, six years where these two guys are consistently top 10, at least, in scoring and doing that. Dan, what do you think? I agree with you, Tyler, that I think Leon is is as good as he's going to, you know, as he, as he can be right now. I think that the the X factor that's going to play into it is having line mates that he can consistently trend with, you know. And if Yamamoto and Nugent Hopkins are it, then then the ceiling does hit, yeah, 125 points, you know. And that's and that's pretty amazing to say. Uh, with also the caveat that that Connor McDavid has a, a higher ceiling given some line mates that he can consistently be with. So I think I think the X factor is the people that we put around him. And if we continue to put them around him consistently, Rick and Leon get better. Yeah, I guess so. I don't think he's going up like another level like we we've seen him do. But yeah, I can see him, you know, creeping up to 120 points, something like that, kind of rounding out his game in the defensive end a bit. Maybe it's just becoming a little bit more reliable two way. I guess that would make him a little bit better. Um, yeah, offensively, yeah, I expect to see what we've seen to us, you know, at least last year. We will see that for the next, you know, the duration of his contract. For me, that's where I think he can get better. Is if he when he starts to really tighten things up in his own defensive zone, then I think that's where he's really going to shine. Because I think that, I mean, it's not. I think obviously, less time spent in his own zone means more time that he's probably got the puck at the other end of the ice. So, I think that that's where he's going to get better. And I wouldn't be surprised at all by the time that the NHL gets back on the ice that both he and Connor have probably done some kind of weird work to improve like things like yeah. face-offs and stuff. Like Connor's probably spent the last, you know, since August when they got bumped out, just taking face-offs from some robot machine he hand-built <laughs> himself because he wants to get better at it or something. And I think that Leon's in the same kind of breath but as that as well. A, a big next step for them is going to be, uh, you know, continuing to prove that they're dominant playoff performers. Like you look at Dry Settlement, 22 points in 17 career playoff games. McDavid has 18 in 17 career playoff games as well, because you count those Blackhawks games for technically playoff games uh, for stats. Like, if those two guys ever get a chance, or when they get a chance, I should say, 
to go to the third round, to go to a cup final. It's going to be great to watch them score clutch goals and sort of build that into the reputation. Changing gears again, my friends, I want to talk about the old barn because news came out that on November 3rd, Zach Land covered this for WeathersNation.com, the final proposal for the exhibition lands will hit a public hearing on November 3rd. The first step of whatever comes will be the demolition of Northlands Coliseum, Skyreach Center, Rexall Place, whatever you want to call it. It'll always be Skyreach Center to me. Um, I just want to go with, with, we all knew this was coming. We all knew this was happening. I just kind of want to go around the horn really quickly and just be like, well, it sucks, but man, I had some good memories at the old barn. If, if I say, what is some of your best memories of Rexall Play, Skyreach Center, North Lines Coliseum, whatever you want to call it? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Dan? Uh, for me, it's, you know, it's the Coliseum. Um, I wasn't, our family wasn't, you know, well to do or anything. Uh, so we usually, if we got to go to a game, it was through gifted tickets. Um, I remember one time we had, we were gifted tickets and we were actually snowed out, which like happened like three times, I think ever in Edmonton's history. Um, so I actually ended up going to see one of Gretzky's games back, uh, with the Kings, um, against the Oilers as like a makeup. I don't know how that worked out. It was nonsense to, to think nowadays, but, uh, to be able to see Gretzky in Kings colors, no less, but, uh, that was, that was pretty damn special. And then, for me, it, it was just a lot of um, a lot of interacting with Oilers fans in the hallways of that stadium through some tough ass years. Um, and an emphasis on the ass. Uh, you know, it was. I, I remember I was one time I was wearing a shirt that had Connor McDavid and and it has it. it he's been Obama sized with the Hope uh, logo underneath. And and some Oilers fan, random Oilers fan, after we'd lost like five to nothing or something, came up to me and just poked me in the stomach and was like, nope. And I was just like, I don't know. It's just one of those like weird moments that I have saved in my memory banks that I can never get rid of. But, but it's, 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 it's one of those places that we called home for a long time. And I, and I hope that, you know, everybody listening to this has a memory of it. And, and you know, I'm, I, I'm sure the building's going to go down in the next year and, and it's going to be a sad day. But, uh, but yeah, it's fun to listen to the memories. Tyler, you're the youngster in the group. Yeah. What memories do you have from... Oh, and first of all, what is the arena called to you? Rexall. And what is your... Uh, I knew it, it was going to be Rexall. Yeah, it's, it's Rexall <laughs> for me. That's all I really ever... Skyreach. It was Rexall for the 06 Cup run, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it would have been Rexall the entire time I it remember was, being an oil. It was Skyreach right before that. Yeah. With the scissor lifts outside. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but all my memories are just kind of going to games with my dad, right? Like it's kind of where I fell in love with hockey was g- getting a chance to go to as many games as I did with him. Um, I remember sitting at, in broadcasting school at Nate the day of the final game and my dad texts me and he's like, ah, do you want to go tonight? And I was like, well, sure. But like, we don't have tickets. And he was like, well, just find some. And he, he told me to just buy them no matter what. And then I like left school early and he zipped, picked me up. And uh, we, we went and watched the final game together. Um, I, as I know, everyone has great memories of getting shit faced at Rexall Place. Uh, me, not so much because I wasn't of legal age for pretty much all the games I got to go to. But I remember I went to a game with my dad like a month before I turned 18, and it's where he bought me my first ever, or it's where it was the first time my dad ever bought me a beer. I was sitting at the seat during the intermission, just like on my phone or whatever. And he was like, well, like he would always go out and have a smoke during the intermissions. Because, you know, why would you want to sit and chat with each other, right? We don't do that. <laughs> just, uh, um, and he was like, I'm going to get a beer. Uh, do you want one? And I was like, uh, yes. And uh, he for every, bought me a beer. It was for, every other, for every other father, son, mother, daughter, whoever, in that exchange, the parent may have been ex- it may have been joking, but we know your dad wasn't joking in that, uh, in that moment. He was literally asking you, do you want a beer? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like I was whatever. Like I said, like three weeks away, or it would have been it would have been less than that because I think it was a regular season game, and I was born in the middle of October, so it would have been like probably a home opener, I think. And nice. uh, I was would have been days away from turning eighteen, and he went and bought me a beer, and I was remembering like, damn, this is cool. I'm like sitting at an Oilers game having a beer. Goddamn, and I, and I just I just have so many memories of going to games with my dad, and that's what's always going to be special when I think about Rogers or Rexall Place. See, I wish that you could have had the memory of getting absolutely lambasted up in the up in the gallery <laughs> and trying to make Me your too. way down the stairs at the end of the game. 
always an adventure. Rick, best memories from the building. First of all, what do you call it, and what is your best memories from there? That's that's the Coliseum to me. Um, and dude, I've I I have a bunch. I you know there's those playoff games in the '90s and the early 2000s. We know you get there and 45 an hour before the game, and everyone's in there always chanting Bell for you. you can you can feel it in your chest. Uh, he's you know skating back into his own net because even that even he can't handle uh, how much is going on. I was there for the Gretzky game, um, the home opener in, eight, in in '99 when the uh, when they retired his jersey. Uh, I still have my ticket at home from that. Uh, to the last game, I was there for the last game too, and somehow uh, through you know good luck, I was able to weasel my way into the super exclusive party in the club area at the end of the, at the end of the game. And so, yeah, I mean, a ton of memories from, from that night, from, you know, just hanging out with a bunch of the guys and, uh, it's everything, man. It's, uh, you'll miss like walking in there. I would have really loved to see them somehow get a bunch of different ice, uh, services in there and just use it, you know, two levels and whatever. But guys, we just need to get on with it. We need to get a thing out of there and, and yeah. move on. I think you, it kind of like, you hate, you don't want to see it do to kind of like rot away by itself. You know, Yankee stadium was, blown up you know like uh weeks later months later it's you know you got to move on for me when i think of it first of all sky center um when i think of it one of my first memories was walking up to the arena as a kid and seeing the purple lights on the outside and just the (laughs) glow that they would change if it was christmas it was red and green and they would do that all the time and that's what i always remembered walking through the parking lot up to which parking lot though were you like parking in the arena parking lot we oh no were you at the Agricom walking over 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 top of one eighteen? No, there was those grain elevators that were like behind the rink. I yeah, guess yeah. that would be west of it. I guess. And yeah, I think so. We'd walk probably three, four, or five blocks because we parked on the street because it was free, <laughs> and it wasn't so bad in October, November. But by the time you got to go to a game in January, February, if you were lucky enough, that was a walk that was brick that was cold. And I, I don't know how, how well you remember the mid nineties, but there were some lean years in there. So I remember <laughs> watching some horrible hockey games and having to do that walk. But for me, the, my favorite memory of, of the old barn has to be the 2006 cup run. At the time I was actually a sales rep for a promotional company that landed a contract with, with the Oilers for doing some promo during the playoffs. Part of our compensation was that we got two tickets to every home game. And seeing as I was the the rep that went out on site all the time, I got the ticket. So I got to see uh, game six, the win against Detroit, which happened to be Steve Eisenman's last game. I got to see, I saw Smitty's teeth get knocked out and have Horkov score in overtime. I'll never forget when the arena ran out of beer and they made an announcement after like the first overtime period or something like that. I've never heard a boo that loud in my life. <laughs> it was incredible. That was the was, triple overtime game against Detroit, right? That's uh, against, no, against San Jose. San Jose, all right. Yeah, and they, uh, they ran out of beer and everybody went crazy. I'll also never forget as long as I live, there was a, there was a goal review. It was, I believe it was Hemsky that scored and they were doing a goal review against Detroit. And the review was taking a minute. And the entire building throughout the review was chanting Manny Legacy's name. And it was like what Rick said. It was that thunderous repetition. I remember it started during the break. It went clear through a commercial break, came back through until the end of the goal review. And I'll just never forget the Manny, Manny, Manny chant. And even Legacy later on admitted how much that rattled him to have the entire building with the silver pom pom shaking the matter. It just doesn't stop, man. It doesn't stop. Like Belfort in the 90s was great. Turco, it fucking rolls right off the tongue as well. It was so much fun. You can feel it in your chest. I like, you can feel the excitement. It was great. It was the best. I love that I place. Also, Sorry, go ahead, Deb. I forgot my memories of the Edmonton Drillers and the Edmonton <laughs> Rush as well. <laughs> That played out of that building. Do you guys? Did you guys ever go see indoor soccer at Rexall or no. Tri Reach or whatever it was at that oh, time? No. Oh man, what went. a good time! And they give out free tickets to any soccer team that wanted them. <laughs> That's how I got to go see them. Yeah, it was a great old barn. Um, not necessarily in a great area, but uh, we had a lot of fun there. And I remember going over to drink at. I mean, it 
up 9,000 names over the course of the, my fandom, like Diesel Ultra Lounge or whatever you want to call it. And they would give you beers and red solo cups and you'd go there pregame and have a drink and then make your way in. It was the best. So it's a sad day when that'll go. But you know what? We had a hell of a lot of memories in the old barn and I can't. And I, if you're listening to this right now, share your favorite Rexall memories with us. ON Radio Podcast on both Twitter and Instagram, which reminds me, Tyler. I've been complaining that nobody has reviewed this podcast for weeks, but <laughs> in a surprise to no one, Dan, you'll, uh, you'll know this from sitting beside me for years now. I'm the moron. I just <laughs> didn't see them. I didn't see them. There were dozens of new reviews for the podcast on Apple Podcasts. So I'm going to go through a couple of these. We're going to do these on a weekly basis. If you can do us a favor, we want to beat real life, despite the fact that Tyler and I are both on that podcast as well. We want to beat uh, real life and climb the rankings of the best sports podcast in Canada. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Grizz4327. He gave us a five-star review. For all its problems, at least Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice was tonally consistent. I don't necessarily think that it was better than Justice League. Both are just okay. <laughs> but here you've got an awkward combination of Snyder's very morbid pistache style and weed and sarcastic and dopey Saturday morning cartoon writing that you wonder what they what the final product would look like if the movie had just been a singular vision. I don't know what that has to do with our podcast, but I like a five star review. That's unbelievable that he would have us say that. <laughs> We're gonna get too many ridiculous reviews. We're gonna get like banned from Apple Podcasts. <laughs> uh Shin Hitter. Shin Hitter. Another five-star review. He says, awesome podcast. Wish there was more than one per week. It's fantastic. You continue to create content even when there isn't a lot happening in the Oilers world. Uh, <laughs> telling us. Today's a great <laughs> example of it. We're sitting here before the podcast being like, fuck, if we get 45 minutes of stuff to talk about today, <laughs> we are going to be lucky. And it's like the 55 minute or 50, what, 53 minute mark right now? 51 minute mark. And we're like still cruising. Haven't done hot and cold performers yet. Corbin says, another five-star review. Gentlemen, we are very popular. Big fan of all the Nation podcasts. Good vibes and great topic. You boys make my day at work entertaining. Being a lifelong Oilers fan in Northern Alberta, I can relate to a lot of the topics and passion for the team. You now have 14 listeners. Keep doing what you guys do and keep huge forever. I like that. He can relate to the topics. Uh, Corbin, does your dad also not speak to you much when you go to games? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a random stranger walk up to you and poke you in the belly at Rexall? <laughs> uh, well, you know what? We've got plenty of reviews, and we're not going to do all of them because um, I want to save some as we continue on. But I think this is a perfect way to send off this week's review. Review corner, of the reviews. Review of the reviews. I like Ooh. that. Bluke45, another five-star review, says, My favorite part is hot and cold performers of the week, specifically the buttons. Specifically the button. So Tyler, that'll oh. be your cue to get your buttons ready. <laughs> so we're going to go into that right now. He also adds, shout out Damien, best wishes. So that nice. is from Blue 45 on Apple Podcast. Again, we have plenty of these that I'm going to read on a weekly basis. Please review the podcast. Give us a rating. Help us bump it up. Help us you bump can it up. literally make Bag Milk say just about anything. He just told us that he loves Batman versus Superman. Yeah. Yep, Batman Shout versus Superman Grizz. Dawn of Justice was uh, totally <laughs> consistent. So whatever you want to put in there, what's I'm in. The, what's our rank right now? Uh, we have 113 ratings overall. And this is a average rating, a five-star podcast. 99 five-star reviews, eight four-star reviews, fair, three three-star reviews, fair. one two-star review, and okay. two one-star reviews. So Ooh. I will, I will let find us know those. who you are that gave us one star. Don't worry about it, Dan. I will find those. Yeah. And uh, actually, you know what? Let's fucking read one right now. <laughs> Where are the most critical? If you're it, totally like, and that's the thing, right? We'd like to hear criticism as well. We don't need to have our tires pumped all the time. I mean, just most of the time, but not all the time. I had someone text into the radio station today and tell me that I'm terrible at my job and like I, I should be fired and all this. And I responded <laughs> and I was like, why? Why is there so much hate, man? And he was like, it's not hate. I actually like you. I just don't want you to be caught off guard when you're fired. <laughs> and he tried to play it off. And he was like trying to suck up to me after being like, so what are you doing this weekend, man? But he was trying to play it off. Like telling me I'm dog shit at my job is just being a good friend. So when I get fired, I'm not like, why did I get fired? He's like, I'm just setting you up for it, man. 
Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> just scanning really quickly. Good podcast, generally entertaining, but the f bombs make you sound uneducated and unable to express your thoughts. I oh. kill that, and I give you a five. That's not bad. That's that's a valid criticism. I'll Fuck take that. that. That's Vice Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Vice I was wondering Ross. who's going to be the first person to say that. I'm right. kidding. I'm uh, sorry. We should watch our mouths. Tyler, I will put soap in your mouth again. <laughs> Last time it was awkward. Whatever. Get your buttons ready, boys. Yeah, it is good. time for Oodle Noodle Hot Cold Performers of the Week, where we look at the last seven days and discuss what was great and not so great in our lives and the world of sports. As always, I want to thank Oodle Noodle for making this possible. Head on into any of their 14 locations around the city, and they will donate 10% from all takeout and curbside orders to a local charity and initiative. This week, they're doing Positively Princessed, who they dress up and visit uh, charities around the city dressed as Marvel characters. Um, if you haven't seen the video of Jay learning how to be a princess, head on over to at Oodle Noodle Graham on Instagram or Oodle underscore Noodle on Twitter to check that out because it is hilarious. So as we do every week, boys, I'm going to start with our veggies. It's time for the cold performer of the week. I'm looking at Rick. He is the biggest on my screen right now. Rick, your Oodle Noodle cold performer of the week. I don't know if it's one specific, but it's just this whole situation we have right now, four days a week, four nights a week, you're going to get home after work, you're going to sit down, you're going to flip on the TV, and you're not going to have anything to watch. Like, no sports right now, that is the cold performer. Just no sports, man. This I can't handle this. What the hell is going on? Yeah, no sports coming back and then going away, sports jerks. <laughs> Big time. It's time for us to get into uh, I'm looking at our friends at Odd Shark right now, what you can bet on. I might get into ping pong. I don't oh, know. College, college football, football tonight, buddy. College football tonight. Mr. Nation Dan, your Oodle Noodle Cold Performer of the Week. Yeah, I warned you guys ahead of time. I've got two. Uh, just <laughs> came across the wire Perfect. right before we hit air. Uh, the OHL is announcing, without any prompting from a government or anybody like that, uh, that they are going to be removing hitting from hockey this season. So, OHL, you can go F yourself. Ah, I took it away. See, I took out the F-bomb. Uh, my other cold performer of the week, and I've talked about this a few times, the, the big problem hockey has is the way it's covered. And, a, and a, for an organization like Sports Illustrated to talk about how they, they know how to cover sports and think that they know what they're doing with sports, to then have their cover this week for the, uh, for the World Series Championship uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, and on the front of the cover, all it says in big letters is L.A. Kings. It's just absolutely daft. What? It's just such a stupid, soft thing for them to do. I put it up on HockeyFights.com. They're, they're, the cover of their article says World Series Champions, and then it has lower down the page, it says L.A. Kings, just in big letters. As if there's not a team already called the L.A. Kings. So it's Sports Illustrated for your inability to, to recognize that there's a team called the L.A. Kings. I'm upset. Uh, shout out to LeBron James for winning the World Series as well. Right, Dan? Yeah. Thank you. Huge, huge day for the LA Kings finding out that they won the World Series this week. Uh, Tyler Remchuk, your Oodle Noodle Cold Performer of the Week. Um, the Big Brother finale, it, there was no suspense at all. I mean, the Big Brother finale is rarely ever like amazing with like big twists and turns and drama. But I mean, I know the guy who should have won did end up winning. But there was no drama in the Big Brother finale. This whole season was just kind of bad. So having to sit through all that, um, the Big Brother finale, you get my cult performer of the week. We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out <laughs> deceived. How I feel. Uh, I'm going to take the obvious one here. My Oodle Noodle cult performer of the week, Arizona Coyotes. Everybody knows why. Yep. I don't really need to say much more than that. They, they know why. Arizona Coyotes Cold Performer of the Week. Slipping over to the positive of the past seven days, I'm going to reverse the order. Mr. Tyler Garemchuk, what is good? Your Oodle Noodle Hot Performer of the Week. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I honestly just want to take this time again to, to talk about how great I think all the stories about Joey Moss has been, the support for the Moss family, uh, his sister Vicky was on TSN 1260, just said she was overwhelmed with all the great stories that everyone 
was telling of her younger brother. So I, I just wanted to say that to all the players who came out and, and took their time to, to share their stories of Joey, for all the players who would have had a positive impact, for everyone, whether it's Dwayne Mandrusiak and his staff or the training staff with the Oilers, everyone who had a positive impact on Joey's life, everyone who has a great Joey story and came forward to share it over the last you know, 72 hours here, kind of. I just wanted to give them a, a bit of a round of applause. I don't have a button for this, but my hot performer of the week is uh, everyone who who made the last few days kind of kind of so special and did a great job remembering a great life that Joey Moss lived. I uh, couldn't, couldn't agree more myself, Mr. Nation. Dan, you were a hot performer of the week. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't even, there's nothing you can do uh, about that one there, Tyler. I, I, that was a great comment. Um, I mean, I guess to try and follow that up, um, I'm going to give it to the to the Dallas Stars for their third jersey that they just announced this week. I think, if anything, I just want to give it to them because they've gotten so much hate for this jersey design. But I like that they went out and did something, even if it's absolutely ridiculous and it's something that you'd only see on like NHL 21 creative. I think we all, you know, we all talked about it last week, even just on this podcast. We want some originality. We want some excitement. The Dallas Stars sure as hell tried to do that this week with their neon, neon green Dallas Stars jersey. So I'll give it to them for the hot performance of the week. I like this right here. I agree. I tend to agree. Like it got panned, and it's funny that uh, you know Monster Energy is going to get a bunch of free promo from the Dallas Stars. But I think that they took a swing. And that's what I respected about it. They tried to do something different, and they took a swing. And I'll give them credit for it. And um, they got Ovechkin to model for them. <laughs> you know? Shoot the wrong way, though. Uh, Rick, your Oodle Noodle Hop from the Week. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give it out to uh, everybody at 1260 there who... Chef Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> who made it... Um we made it easy, like just to sit back and listen. I think mean, it was a day and a half, two straight days of where you could just put your feet up and and just listen to stories that, that that were you know that made you feel good. So as much as it came from a bad place, um, yeah, we they made it uh, as good as it could, it could be. As someone who got to see sort of the behind the scenes of all that, one guy who gets ruthlessly torn apart by Edmonton sports media listeners, Matt Iwanek. He deserves, <laughs> out of all the staff at our radio station, he deserves 90% of the credit for how well that day went on um, from bumping Thursday night football so we could spend a couple hours in the evening talking about Joey to you know making sure that everyone at the station had a couple of former Oilers or a couple of former Eskimos to come on. Matt Iwanek did almost all all of that. So I think uh, just while we're giving credit for that, um, I'm not going to take any. It should all go towards Matt Iwanek, who some people really don't like, but y- you got to <laughs> give him props for uh, how he handled that Joey Moss day. He did a great job. Uh, my little, little hot performer of the week, I'm going to give it to a local fan named Brian McKay. I, wrote, I just wrote about it on the, on the Nation earlier this morning. He started joeyforever.ca as a, as a place for um, fans to come and submit their favorite stories about Joey. Because while there was a bunch of, like Tyler said, great stories coming out from uh, football players, from Oilers, from around the NHL, and people that got to interact with him, plenty of fans have their own stories or moments with Joey that they want to share as well. And Brian McKay created, again, jo- joeyforever.ca is a place where you can go and be anonymous if you want, submit a story about Joey, and have it go up on a place there. So I want to give another plug, joeyforever.ca. Put some respect on my name. Indeed. I love that we're going to, cr- we're going to create a graphic for this. That's going to say like TSN 1260 for the Joey, all the players that came together for Joey and this fan that came together for Joey and Dan <laughs> with the Dallas stars. One thing about those jerseys, one thing about those jerseys, they really went after the, I think they did some of the, like, the Oregon Ducks did. They need to do something with a helmet. If you're going to go that crazy on the uh, on the jersey, you can't just roll that regular black helmet. Either go matte black with some stuff in there. Racing stripes. Or on the look. Like I, I'm literally looking at the at the Ducks uniforms right now, and uh, yeah, you got to get something going on with the uh, with the helmet there too, and then I'll be okay with that jersey. Just use a splash of radioactive paint every day. You know, just uh, <laughs> light up their heads. <laughs> I like that they got different. I like that they got different. 
Uh, from all of us here at Withers Nation Radio, I'm Bag Milk. Rick's here, Nation Dan's here, Tyler Remchuk's here. This is episode 110. I want to thank Sherwood Ford the Giant, SkipTheDish.ca, and Oodle Noodle for making this all possible. And of course, for you for listening and reviewing, as I've been asking for for weeks. Again, I am my own cold performer of the week because I'm a moron and I couldn't find them until this week. But <laughs> you know what? I'll own that. I'll own my own deficiencies on the internet. Thank you very much for being here. Please tell a friend, a coworker, cousin, auntie, uncle, whoever you got around you about Oilers Nation Radio. Brand new episodes every Friday. You can download, subscribe everywhere. Until next time, have a great weekend, everybody. Shout out, Damien. Best wishes. Thanks for listening to Oilers Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media to stay up to date and never miss a podcast.